This story occurred when I was driving back home from work one night. It was snowing like crazy and had been for quite some time. I got off work late, which was not good news for me. When I got back to my car, I had to clear off all the snow with a snow scraper. There were probably about three or four inches on top of it already. When I finally got inside my car and left, I quickly realized the driving conditions were not safe at all. It was around 10 p.m. at this point. I drove very slowly on the roads, and there seemed to be hardly anybody else out driving. It would normally take me about 15 minutes to get home. This time, though, it took almost 30. Basically, the entire way back, I really only noticed one car. It was driving right behind me. I don't even remember at what point it started to drive behind me, but I think it was pretty early on. Each time I turned, I did not expect the car to turn with me, but it did each and every time. By the time I was almost home, I assumed this must be one of my neighbors. The roads were so slippery that you had to take every turn very slow. When I turned onto my street, the car behind me did as well, at a very slow speed. I was pretty sure it must be a neighbor. There were a lot of other houses on my street, and I didn't know everyone that lived there. When I got to my driveway, I turned and pulled in. The car following me kept going down the street. I have a garage at my house, but it's detached. I drove up to it and then opened the garage. I drove inside and closed the garage door. I turned my car off and got out. After that, I got my bags from the back seat. Then I left the garage to walk back to my house. As soon as I opened the garage door though, I saw a car parked in my driveway. It was the same one that had seemingly followed me. At first, I was just really confused. I didn't know what was going on. It was in between my garage and house, and I had to walk around to the front door. When I saw that car, I stopped for a second and thought about what to do. I couldn't tell who was driving the vehicle because of it being so dark out and the headlights and all of the snow. I didn't know who it was or what they were doing here. Instead of confronting them or something, I decided not to. I chose to ignore their presence and walk right past. Looking back, it was kind of weird, but I just wanted to get inside as soon as possible. I figured they would probably just drive away once I did. Plus, it was snowing hard, and it was much safer inside. I turned and began walking along the front of my house to the door. When I was about halfway there, I heard the door to the car open. Whoever had been inside must have gotten out. I kept walking and didn't bother to turn around. When I just about made it to my front door, I finally decided to look over my shoulder. When I did, I saw a man standing there next to the car, wearing this really creepy-looking clown mask. It sent a shiver down my spine. I hurried and unlocked the door, then went inside. The man did not move at all. He just stood there. It was really creeping me out. After getting inside, I went to the other end of the house. I wanted to just ignore his presence. When I went back a few minutes later, he was gone. The car, the guy in the clown mask. I was happy to see that they were gone, but the whole situation still seemed really odd to me. Why would somebody follow me in that bad of a snowstorm? The driving conditions were terrible. Then he just stood there looking at me like a complete weirdo. It's something that still leaves me wondering to this very day. This happened back when I was a teenager. I think I was 14 years old and probably a freshman in high school. It was the winter time and sometime in the early evening. The sun had already set and it was very dark out. We were getting a large snowstorm. I was sent outside by my mom to shovel the driveway. She was cooking and said the food would be ready when I got back inside. It was kind of my job to shovel the driveway, and I didn't really mind it. When it was snowing this badly though, it could really be tough. 
We had a pretty long and straight driveway, and I needed to shovel it now, even though it was still snowing. That way, the next morning, instead of having a whole foot of snow to shovel, there would be much less built up. It would be faster and easier as well. I went as quickly as I could, and things were going pretty well. Our neighborhood was generally pretty quiet, and not that many neighbors were outside or anything. We also lived in an area with only about 10 houses on it in total, so I pretty much knew all the neighbors and all their cars and stuff. When I had reached near the end of the driveway and was shoveling the very last section, I heard a car coming down our street. It entered and came around the corner, going very slowly. It was a larger and older looking black SUV. It looked to be a Chevy Suburban. I had never seen this car before and wondered whose it was. It slowly drove past me as I shoveled. It went around the loop of the cul-de-sac. It then started to come back down the street. At that point, I guessed it must have been somebody who turned down the wrong area and were going back around to go the right way. They were still going extremely slowly though. They started to slow down even further in front of our driveway. It kind of creeped me out a little bit. They did move past, but then pulled over on the side of the street, right in front of our house. It was only about 50 feet away from me. I wondered who on earth could be in there. In fact, I just wanted to run back inside of my house, right then and there. I figured that would be a bit weird though and decided to just continue shoveling. The car sat there with the engine running, and nobody attempted to get out of it. I glanced over, but I couldn't see who was inside at all. It was not a good angle, plus it was so dark, and the windows were heavily tinted. I tried desperately to hurry up and finish, so I wouldn't have to be around this strange vehicle any longer. That was when the SUV shut itself off, but nobody got out still. After two or three minutes of the SUV just sitting there, the doors opened. I was now almost at the end of the driveway. I saw a man get out of the car. He then began to walk over to me. He was tall and thin and wore a black jacket and jeans. He also wore a winter hat and had this long hair. When I saw he was walking straight for me, I really wanted to just get out of there. I told myself not to worry though, and that I shouldn't be afraid of people. The guy walked right up to me. Hello there, he said. I said hi back. I was starting to get really nervous. The man asked me if I needed some help shoveling the driveway, and said that he could help me if I wanted. I told him no thanks, and that I was just about done anyway. He then asked me if I lived there. I said yes. He stood there for a few moments as I finished up the last of the shoveling. He then said something that really creeped me out. Hey, do you want to ride anywhere? I asked him why. I could take you anywhere you want to go right now, if you want. I was really confused by this. I said no to the man. I needed to go inside right now. I started to walk away in a hurry. The guy stood there and watched me as I started heading back. When I'd made it about halfway up the driveway, I heard him running back to his car. It was a big relief. When I made it back inside, I told my parents right away about that weird guy. We looked out the window, but he was already gone. Now, this is one of the stranger things that's ever happened to me, but that night I stayed up kind of late. It was around 10 p.m. or so. I happened to glance out my window and noticed the SUV was back. I couldn't believe it. I kept my eyes on it. I could see the engine was running and the same man was probably inside. I was really hoping he wouldn't get out. I really couldn't believe he had come back. He was parked in the exact same place as before too. After about a minute the car drove away. I went and told my parents. My dad went outside but obviously the man was long gone by then. After that night I never saw the car or the man. The story still gives me the creeps when I think back to it though. I don't know why that guy came down our street or what he was doing. I'm really glad he didn't try to force me to go with him or do something even worse. 
Looking back, I probably should have gone inside as soon as I saw that car parking in our front yard. This is something really bizarre that happened to me last winter. I live by myself in a smaller one-story home. The neighborhood I live in is somewhat typical. However, I know most of the neighbors pretty well and get along with all of them. Last winter, we had a pretty bad snowstorm at one point. It was over a weekend and started one night at roughly 5 o'clock. The snow was supposed to last until early the next morning, and we were going to be getting several inches of it. Everything was normal other than the snowstorm. I went to bed at around 11 p.m. or so. I woke up the next morning at probably 7.30 or 8. My bedroom is at the front side of the house. As soon as I sat up and looked out the window, something really shocked me. There was a snowman that had been built outside, looking directly into my bedroom window. The snowman was very detailed and well done. It had eyes and a mouth made from buttons. It was probably about five feet away from my window. It really spooked me at first, until I realized what it actually was. Then I got spooked again, wondering how it even got there in the first place. I know I certainly hadn't made it. It had to have been my next door neighbor's kids. My next door neighbors were a husband and wife who had kids in their early teens and middle school ages. They were the only kids in the immediate area of the neighborhood. Still, it seemed kind of unlike them to do that. Why wouldn't they just build it in their own yard? Plus, they were really well behaved, and I didn't think they would go into my yard without permission. I went outside to snowplow my driveway. When I got out there, I saw my next door neighbor. His name is Todd. He was already out using the snowblower. I walked over to him at the end of his driveway and waved. He stopped his snowblower and said that I had a nice snowman in the front yard. I told him I had no idea how it even got there and asked him if maybe his kids had made it during the night. He said no. He told me he had been inside with them watching a movie the night before. He assumed I'd made it myself. We joked a bit after that. Though it was a funny thing, it was also a little bit strange. After that, I finished clearing my driveway and went back inside. The temperatures we were having were in the high 20s, all the way and up to the mid 30s. This created a good snowball or snowman type of snow. Fast forward to the next morning, I woke up and went into the kitchen. The kitchen is at the back side of my house. There's a window out to the backyard. When I looked out of it, there was a new snowman that hadn't been there the day before, facing the back window and looking right at me. It was just a few feet away. Somebody had made another one. This one, just like the first, was very well made, but unlike the other one, it had more props. Instead of just a face out of buttons, it had a gardening shovel used as its hand, and it was made to look like it was holding a pitchfork. That was when I realized this shovel and pitchfork had come from my garage. I went outside, then went to the garage. The door had been left open. Nobody was inside of it, though. I got really creeped out now. Somebody was going into my yard in the middle of the night and making snowmen. This time, they'd actually entered my garage. I had left the door unlocked by accident, I guess. I made sure to lock it usually. When whoever it was made that snowman in the front yard, I thought it was kind of funny. But now that it was in the backyard and they'd gone inside my property without permission, this was too far. Still though, I had no idea who was doing it. It was always in the middle of the night, and no matter how long I stayed awake, I never saw or heard anything. I looked out the windows multiple times that night before going to bed. I didn't see anybody. When I got up the next morning, both of the snowmen had been destroyed. They were just gone, nowhere to be seen. Somebody had torn them down and stolen the tools as well. I was really weirded out by the whole situation. After that, there were no more strange occurrences, though. No more snowmen, no more strange things happening. Still to this day, I wonder who was doing these things to me.
I was a captain in the army at the time these events took place. In my country, it's obligatory for all men to serve for 12 months in the military, usually when they're fairly young. That year, my job was to watch over the new soldiers in my battalion. I was known as a good captain, but I was strict at times, and had threatened some of the soldiers with detention for not doing their duties properly. One of the soldiers was this 23 to 25 year old guy. I can't exactly remember. He looked a bit younger and seemed scared and not really into this stuff. Let's call him Evan. One day, I punished him for a minor offense. I think he even teared up a bit. When I left in the evening, I saw him in the street staring at me, and that's when it all began. Before I explain what happened, I should say that I had seen some weird things but ignored them. For example, I saw that he had two cell phones. One smartphone and an old flip one. I knew in the area that some criminals tended to use these. I once heard someone on the other line call him boss. He approached me and started talking to me like I was not his superior. He demanded that I be good to the soldiers and do what he said from now on, that no one messes with him and things along those lines. It was nothing like the poor, scared boy I had seen before. Of course, I got really angry. I started shouting at him and told him he would get a 20-day detention if he was lucky. He didn't care. He told me I had 24 hours. I returned home really angry. I opened the door, but before I could lock it, I saw a big guy looking at me. Before I knew it, two other big guys appeared from behind me out of nowhere and grabbed my arms, one on each side. I tried to reason with them. The first guy approached me and punched me hard five times. They put me down and jumped me and beat the hell out of me. It took me an hour to get back on my feet. I called the colonel and told him I couldn't work because of my injuries. Of course, I didn't tell him exactly what happened. After some time, my phone began to ring. It was Evan on the other end. Where are you? Shall I send more to bring you over? If you don't show up until the evening, I'll send the boys to make you even more beautiful. He hung up at that point. I was scared as fuck. The next day, these bodyguards were banging at my door. I called Evan, apologized, and quit my job. He told me that if I did something he didn't approve of again, he would kill me and dismember me. It's been four months now. I work in a small minimum wage job, but the shock hasn't passed. I know his goons are keeping an eye on me. I saw two of those men in three different spots around town. I learned from friends that this guy is some sort of mafia don or something who sells protection. I guess you should never mess with those guys. I remember one night I just couldn't sleep for some reason. Every time I laid down to rest, I got this overwhelming feeling. I almost thought I could even hear a voice urging me to get up. I grabbed a book and stayed up, just listening to the thunderstorm while feeling a bit silly. Four hours later, at about 2 a.m., I felt like something was telling me to go get a glass of water. This was all so weird, but as long as I was already staying up until 2 a.m. because of a feeling, I might as well just follow what it said. As I walked down the stairs, I began to hear a sound coming from the office. A flip of the light switch revealed it was the first couple of drops of a coming leak. The roof had just been redone the week before, so of course I was a bit pissed off. Forgetting about grabbing a drink, I grabbed a bucket and was walking back into the room when the sound of the leak changed. Suddenly, it was like a hose pouring straight into the middle of the room. I threw the bucket underneath. As I was running back with trash bags to cover the computers, it changed. There were now sparks shooting off the floor, and the stream of water looked like a ribbon of glowing plasma. I stared in shock for a moment, before dropping the plastic to hit the light switch and sprinted to the circuit breaker. The rest of the night was waking up my family, climbing into the attic to make sure nothing was on fire. Scorch marks, yes. Flames or coals, no. 
and moving electronics out of the office. It turned out the storm had loosened and tore free a piece of flashing. The angle of the roof had then funneled all that water straight onto the heater and electrical wiring for that section of the house. Because I was in just the right place at the right time, I was able to protect the floor from the electrified water and contain it. I shut off the power just before it scorched the wood and ignited the house. In the end, because of that urge to stay up and walk past the office door, all that night cost us was a coat of paint for the ceiling. The roofing crew came back and fixed up the roof at no cost, because it was only a week old. It still made my skin crawl to look at the scorched wood inside the attic and all over the ceiling. To think about how my parents, sister, and even dogs slept through everything until I shook them awake. Well, technically, I tripped over the dog while waking up my parents, but close enough. What an extremely helpful auditory hallucination. This is a hard story to tell for a couple of reasons. First off, I was really young when this occurred, so the memory is not the clearest in the world. My parents have retold me the story to refresh my memory, but they tell it differently even between each other. The second reason I will tell you at the end of the story. I was six years old, and I was definitely a mama's boy. I followed my mom everywhere and always wanted her attention. I remained like this throughout her entire life. Well, when I was six years old, a cousin of mine named Ethan moved in with us. His parents had recently died in a fire, and his mom was my mom's sister. My mom took him in, and when she did, everything changed very dramatically. Ethan barely ever talked. I guess that's pretty normal for a kid who just lost his parents. Not only that, but he also lived in town, whereas we lived out in the country. I imagine he had friends that he could go out and play with all the time back there, but we lived far away in a house that wasn't close enough to other houses to know anyone around. I was the only one that Ethan really had to play with, but Ethan would not play. He wouldn't go outside or try to climb trees or anything like that. He wouldn't even play board games, really. What he did do, however, was something I definitely did not like. Ethan was super obsessed with my mother. I didn't like that at all. Being a mama's boy, I wanted all her attention. But Ethan would follow her around. Sometimes he would grab her skirt with his hand and hold it up, as if he was trying to keep her from getting away. If my mom or I tried to stop him from doing this, he would start screaming and crying. Everyone thought it was just easier to let him do what he was doing, and the entire time it made me really mad. I was really young though, and probably too young to go out and explore the woods, but with Ethan being around my mom all the time, it was really the only thing I had to do. One day, which actually turned out being a pretty weird one, I went out into the woods to have a quick look around. Being out there was a lot more enjoyable than I thought it would be. The sky was covered with dark thunder clouds, and I was in danger of getting caught up in a storm. I really loved the atmosphere of the darkness during the day though. The wind and the occasional bolt of lightning or crack of thunder that would pierce the darkness of that storm. I don't know how long I was out there really, and at first I didn't really care. I just wanted to be by myself. However, when I decided to go home, I realized I had no idea how to get there. I tried walking back the way I came, but I couldn't be sure which way I'd come from. I hadn't taken the time to look at any landmarks that would remind me of the way out of this place. I was too young at the time to even think of that. The only Lost in the Woods story I ever heard was Hansel and Gretel, and I didn't have any crumbs of bread to lay down so I could remember my path. I was worried. I thought it would be easy to find my way home. I only had to keep walking the same amount of time I'd walked into the woods, and surely that would lead me back out. My six-year-old mind accepted that as solid fact, as silly as it might seem nowadays. 
Well, as you might imagine, my idea didn't quite work, and the storm kept brewing and brewing. I was expecting it to break at any moment, and that scared me too. I'm not scared of storms themselves, but I've never been stuck out in one before. The idea of doing that is what scared me. Fortunately, despite the fact it seemed like it would storm any moment, it didn't start raining. For that, I was thankful. I kept thinking I would get even more lost by the minute, and I would never find my way home. I thought about bobcats, coyotes, animals that were in the area, and the idea scared the hell out of me. Even if the animals didn't get me first, I didn't have any food or water. My young mind was convinced I was definitely going to die out there. Then I saw something in the distance. It was smoke. I immediately thought that someone, possibly even my own father, had made some sort of bonfire. Maybe they could help take me back to my family. So I walked in the direction of that smoke. I was a lot less scared than I had been before. I knew I was going to get out of those woods and everything would be okay. I even remember smiling and running a little toward the smoke. As I got closer, I realized that smoke was definitely coming from my yard. I thought maybe my parents were worried I'd gotten lost in the woods and made a smoke signal to help me get home. I sprinted the rest of the way back into the yard of my house. My heart dropped though when I got close enough to see what was actually going on. No one had built a bonfire to help me find my way out of the woods. The house I'd lived in for my entire life was on fire, and not just any small fire either. The entire house was engulfed in flames. I stopped in the woods, looking at the most horrifying scene I had ever seen in my life. I didn't know what to think until I saw my family standing in the yard. My parents were there and Ethan was standing beside my mom as always. I ran out of the woods directly toward them. My mom grabbed me and hugged me. She didn't know I had gone out into the woods. She thought I had been left behind in the house somewhere. She thought I might be dead and she was absolutely terrified until she noticed me emerging from the woods. The fire department came quickly, but it didn't really matter much. There wasn't a lot they could do, as there were no hydrants out this far in the country. The truck had a tank of water if I remember right, but that didn't stop our home from burning right down to its foundation. The official report was that the house was burned down by an accident. However, even being six years old, I did not accept that. It seemed too weird to me. Ethan's parents died in a house fire, and less than three months after he came to live with us, our house caught fire as well. It seemed like an awfully weird coincidence to me. Yeah, I think Ethan burned down his own house and killed his parents. I think he burned down our house too, and maybe tried to kill us. I kept that thought to myself for many years. Ethan is on the autistic spectrum, which I think might explain his behavior with my mom. I don't think that has anything to do with him burning down houses though, so please don't think that. I think completely separate from his disability, he's just kind of an evil little fuck. My grandma took him in and adopted him basically after that. I only saw Ethan when we went to visit my maternal grandma, and I was glad he was gone. No other houses burned down as far as I know, so maybe I was wrong about him but it just seems a little bit weird that it happened so close together. I grew up as a sort of only child with my mother. My father and her were not together, but I don't want to go too deep into that. Although my mother never had any other kids, my father eventually had a boy and a girl. So I had two half-siblings who were about 10 and 8 years younger than I was respectively. I occasionally would do things with my dad, such as staying with him for a week or so here and there. It was nice to see my brother and sister grow up, and sometimes we went on hiking and camping trips. That was always pretty fun. Well, maybe not necessarily always. There was one time when it was no fun at all. And that's the story I'm about to tell. We had what you would call a sort of close call. 
We went out camping by the river on a sandbar. I was 16 years old at the time. My brother was eight, and my sister was six. We had three tents set up on the sandbar. There was one for my dad, one for me, and one for my siblings to share. We were going to be there for a few days and try our luck at fishing in the river. Everything was set up really good. My dad and I gathered wood, and we made a good bonfire. We got some coals going to start cooking some of the fish we'd caught. Fishing was something all four of us could do, although it was only my dad who caught anything that we were actually able to eat. It seems like a bit of a waste to try and cook minnows. While we were cooking, we heard something from down the river. It took a little bit, but we noticed a boat coming down towards us. The people in the boat were acting really loud and rowdy, making tons of noise and such. Even before they got close to us, my dad and I figured out they must have been really, really drunk. When they got close to us, we saw they were all college-aged kids. When they noticed us, they started waving and such. Then they steered the boat towards the sandbar we were camping on. They anchored the boat by the sandbar, just a little ways up from where we were camping. At first, I thought they were going to try and make their own camp and not really have any involvement with us. How wrong I was. It was two couples and a single guy. They were all drunk and stoned off their asses. But the single guy was the most drunk one of all. I couldn't figure out how this guy was even able to stand, that's how out of it he was. They were playing loud music, acting all rowdy. They brought their boombox and their beer, and eventually came over to our bonfire. They just inserted themselves. We didn't say anything. My dad was in his late 40s and I was 16, but we knew we had to be careful with a bunch of drunken students. Alcohol can change a person dramatically. My dad and I talked with them, mostly just to keep them happy. After a while, though, one of the couples asked to borrow one of the tents. Before anyone could say anything, I offered mine. I had a good idea of why they wanted it in the first place, and I figured better to offer mine before one of the younger kids tried. They were in the tent for about three minutes. Just a side note from the story right now, but if you're going to ask a bone, why would you only do it for three minutes? I mean, come on, what could you possibly accomplish in three minutes? The other couple were pretty shit-faced. I was wondering how everybody hadn't passed out yet. In fact, several times their eyes would close and they would sway back and forth. The single guy was the one that scared me the most, though. He had this big knife that was sheathed and strapped onto his belt. I had been keeping my eye on him the whole time, just in case he decided to use it. He did take it out, and I was about to do something, but he walked away from us. There was a tree stump out on the edge of the sandbar. He went over and kept throwing the knife at it over and over again. My dad had a fillet knife to use for the fish. It was the sharpest knife I had ever seen in my life. He kept it on him the whole time. I went and grabbed the hatchet we used to chop the wood and kept it close to me as well. I decided I knew what I had to do. I went to all of the tents and took the sleeping bags out of them. I do wish I had taken my sleeping bag out before I allowed those two to go at it inside, but oh well. I moved all the bags into my dad's tent. We were all going to sleep in there. The kids were confused because I don't think they knew what was going on at all. They complained because they wanted their own tents, but I made them stop. The five college students then decided to go play in the water. They were swimming around, splashing and such. A couple of them started cussing, and two of the guys, the single guy and one of the couples, began to fight. I don't know how bad the fighting was. I tried to stay out of it as much as possible. We all went into the tent when it was dark enough. We had lights to read books, but it was really hard the whole time. They kept playing loud music, cussing, and doing who knows what. At one point, we noticed shadows outside. Two of the students had come right up to our tent, and it seemed like they were fighting again. I grabbed my hatchet, totally prepared to use it if I had to. One of the guys stumbled and nearly fell onto us, but he was able to right himself in time. My brother and sister somehow were able to fall asleep, 
but my dad and I remained wide awake. We listened for hours as they continued to argue, cuss, and fight. Eventually, at around 4 a.m., I heard the boat start up and listened as it rowed away. Finally, I was able to get a little bit of sleep. When we got up in the morning, we noticed that one of our coolers had been thrown into the fire. The other two tents had been trampled on and were leveled. Fortunately, that was the only thing they did, and none of us got hurt. You never know what people will do when their state is altered. I'm not judging, though. Hell, later in my life, I parted harder than they did, and that was only a few years later. But that was one of the scariest nights I ever experienced. I, 24 and female, moved into a new neighborhood about two years ago with my partner, who's 33, and our child. After six months of living there, in the beginning of the pandemic, we started getting to know our immediate neighbors. They seemed to be homebodies and stayed inside almost all the time. After a bit, they started coming out to talk more, and we all seemed to get along just fine. I'd even considered inviting them over a few times. They could be a bit awkward, though, and difficult to keep conversations going with. We've done paint nights outside a few times, but haven't invited each other inside ever. The couple seems to come outside whenever we're outside coincidentally. They include themselves in our activities and chat here and there and given them some socialization they might have needed, since they tended to dwell inside in the dark, playing video games constantly. I gave my number to the girl when we had an issue between units, just in case of emergencies. We'd exchanged a few messages about the property management, the weather, and stuff like that, but only a few really. Lately, I hadn't been seeing the woman out as much as before, but the guy was always outside every time I was. He started sitting in a lawn chair on his front step daily, for hours at a time. Fast forward, and a friend of mine comes to spend the night. I introduced the neighbor guy to my friend to be polite. He met her dog, said a few random things, and then he went back to sitting on the step for several hours that night. Some days later, he signals me with a psst and asks if everything's okay. I tell him I'm fine and ask what he means. He proceeds to tell me I was sending him mixed signals when my friend was over, and he wanted to make sure I was alright. That didn't make a single bit of sense to me, but I said sorry for the confusion. I assured him I was fine, and went about my usual business. A couple more days pass by. I get a text from him saying who it is, and that he hopes my child and I have a great day. I didn't give him my number, so I found it to be a bit weird, and didn't answer. I started realizing he had been sitting outside in the morning at the time I usually work daily. He would sit outside within 15 minutes of me getting home as well, regardless of the time. The guy would stay out until 4 a.m. some nights, waiting for me to arrive. And the crazier part is, I noticed he would always go inside within 20 minutes of me leaving. He would stay outside for 14 full hours as long as I was home, though. Didn't go out if my partner was home and I was not. Didn't come out if no one was home. He always knew if I was home somehow, even if I switched cars with my partner. I'm uncomfortable, but I don't want to point fingers and make it worse. This dude won't talk to my partner at all, hardly acknowledges him. Meanwhile, he always tries to find ways to talk to me, tries to help walk my dogs to the car for me, tries to play games with my child, knocks on my door asking if I've lost random items that aren't mine. He even texted me a few more times. I've seen all of this on my security cameras, since we've been paying attention to the odd behavior, I can't tell if it's just a super weird coincidence or if he's purposefully watching me every time. Not to mention he makes hand gestures and speaks to himself with no phone out and no headphones. 
One time, I walked a few doors down to visit some other neighbors, when I noticed him getting the mail, which he's never done, right in front of the house I was in. Later, he tried to talk to those neighbors about something as well. Another, I mentioned a yard sale I was having up the road. He never takes walks, but that day he just decided to. I had also recently got a new game console, and he surprisingly gifted me with two $60 games for it, even though I never told him I had one. The other neighbors said he's never sat outside like this before, not in the past five years they've known him. His girlfriend also started questioning him about it. I walked out and overheard her quite upset, with him sarcastically replying, that's just the kind of guy I am. Let's not forget, my boyfriend's car tires were also randomly slashed in our neighborhood. Am I paranoid over these odd coincidences, or do I need to move? <laughs>